Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Warm greetings from Northwest Germany. My name is Dong Wang, and I'm the hostess for today's interview with Professor Dan Watt at Middlebury College in Vermont about his new book, Slavery in East Asia, published by Cambridge University Press. 2022, alongside its toying work, The Blacks of Pre-Modern China, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press over a decade ago. Dang, welcome to my show. I'm so elated that uh, we can do this interview today, August 5th, 2023. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Dang? Okay, Dung, I'm delighted to be with you, and I'm not really sure what might interest your listeners, but I was born in the United States and have always lived here. My original home is the great state of Illinois, so I am a Midwesterner. Illinois, but not Chicago, so I'm from downstate, as we say. My town is called Alton. And it's the first town in Illinois across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. I, from there, moved on as the years moved by to go to college. I ended up in Wisconsin at a small liberal arts college called Beloit. And that was a transformative experience in the sense that it was really there that my interest in China was kindled. I was a student of philosophy, chiefly Western philosophy. But in my sort of discursive time, I encountered some translations of of classical thinkers in the Chinese tradition, Lun Yu of Confucius, Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, and various other thinkers, and found them intriguing in the sense that they tended to have very different answers for the same basic questions that were posed by Western philosophers. And I guess from there, I decided, I don't know, I'm a reasonably intelligent person, so there's no need for me to be at the mercy of these translations. <laughs> so in the attempt to narrow the distance between these thinkers and, and myself, I embarked on a, a study of uh, the Chinese language. The programs in those days were not as formal and established. Uh, I had to cobble together a lot independently, but eventually I moved on. And after college, relocated to New England, where I have lived longer than any other place in my life, entered graduate school at Harvard University, and had an exceptional experience there, great mentors. I was fortunate enough on entering to uh, have a course with the late, great John Fairbank, and my own distinguished mentor was Benjamin Schwartz. And I learned a lot. I think I've been able to apply it. And I think I've probably taken up enough of your time describing my early background. And I hope that suffices. Thank you, Dan. This is wonderful because I actually, many, many years ago, have been to Beloit College. So I know where you were. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my. One summer, I was teaching there, so I had very fond memories of the place. And of course, it was quite easy to go to Chicago or to go to... um, Madison. Yes, from Mm -hmm. Beloit, which I did. So... (laughs) um, Well, that's fantastic, too. Yeah, so wonderful to know where you were. And of course... uh, It all helped me understand why your earlier work focuses on Shao Yun, that very prominent earlier Song Dynasty's philosopher, and of course, kind of my hometown (laughs) 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 compatriot or whatever one would like to define the place. (laughs) Are you? Are you from Loya? Yes, I was. Oh, uh, um, yeah, I was born there. Both my parents actually also are locals and city dwellers. So I spent the first of my 16 years of life in Loyang before I went to college. That's fantastic. Coincident. 
Yeah, so <laughs> lovely to know that I was able to read your great work earlier on. I believe it was your book on Shao Yun was published in the 1990s. Of the... 1996. <laughs> Yeah, I was so delighted actually to meet you in person <laughs> finally this year after citing uh, you and studying your work. <laughs> okay, great, Don. Now, you know, you, um, you've taken on kind of different topics, although I think you stay in the similar time frame, the pre-modern periods. So let's talk about your new topics. Probably for you, it's no longer new, but I'm curious. Many folks, I think, probably tend to link slavery only to the United States and Europe. On the other hand, for those of us specialists dealing with historical documents such as the Qing China, we also know that the Qing Mandarins of different ethnicity were inclined to address themselves as um, your slaves in their official correspondence or memorials to the emperors. This is not that unusual even for European systems at the same time where feudal civility literally demanded that the underlings declare themselves to be subjecting themselves as slaves to their masters. In the 19th century, such formulas such as also in Russia, was still in wide use. So, Don, could you clarify terms like uh, slavery, slaves, the Blacks, East Asia, and pre-modern and medieval, as defined in your twin books? Well, thank you for the question. To address the Chinese case, which is, of course, the one that I, I know best, I think what is crucial is you're stating that these forms of deprecatory self-address were commonplace uh, in ministerial correspondence dispatched to emperor. In doing so, you focused on one of the many protocols that were at very heart of what we later have come to refer to as Chinese imperial autocracy. The trend toward autocracy had probably been present since the establishment of the empire, but there's no question that is most closely identified with the late imperial era of the Ming and Qing dynasties, or at any rate, the post-Yuan period, when ministers seem to have consistently had different relations, to have had a, a categorically different relationship with their sovereigns than in the past. And this relationship was one that was much more servile and largely at the capricious whims of the monarch. With regard to terminology, yes, you are correct that such self-denigrating terms were used. But with etymology, uh, again, to refer to language, always being ever revealing, we find even terms we regard today as relatively neutral have demeaning histories. A very good and very interesting and very common example of uh, what I mean by this is the commonplace term chun, meaning minister or servant. And this term is clearly a pictograph which evolved to become an ideograph if you look at it and have uh, the knowledgeable enough background, we can see that it is a downturned eye. Consequently, signifying that this person should not look sovereign in the face and maintain a kind of servile and dependent relationship with the monarch. This sort of relationship in which there was a great imbalance between uh, the sovereign and the minister was one that even modern commentators like Liang Qichao 
referred to as one of the key detriments to progress, political progress in China, because this relationship was ill-suited for moving forward for China's political progress. And he, he stated that this type of relationship between monarch and minister had to change in order for China to move forward. You asked me about a litany of terms as well, how I would define them. As for slavery, slaves, the Blacks, East Asia, pre-modern and medieval, I would say that my own treatment of these terms, at least in the writing, is rather unexceptional to what people might expect. I think the one term that you targeted that probably deserves greater attention is the Blacks, because as I generally have to do in nearly every instance is remind readers and in lectures, remind audiences that we should not immediately think of the Blacks I'm referring to as Africans or peoples of uh, African descent. In fact, in the Chinese context, this medieval or pre-modern context, these individuals were typically Malay peoples of uh, Southeast Asian extraction. And it's only after a significant passage of time that we can make the argument for Africanized individuals as Blacks in China. I hope that answers, at least in part, uh, what was a very expansive question. I appreciate uh, your informing the listeners about uh, particularly the historical context for the peoples being called Black. They could mean very differently, very widely, actually, in the pre-modern and medieval China. Thank you. I'd like to ask you more along this line. We are all historians. So for me, I have been studying history for 40 years by now. So I would say your recent work presents a giant step further in treating East Asia, especially China, equally as part of world history through examining universal historical themes and human practices and institutions such as enslavement, slavery, racism, and anti-racism in their regional and local contexts and attribute that uh, yields a fascinating um, revelation. So as you know, these issues are not uh, rationally reflected in most state-controlled historiography. This dimension of historical realities needs to be continuously unraveled through our inclusive historical sources. I would imagine it was a labor of love for you, driven not only by our own professional intellectual curiosity, but also professional and civic duty. I wonder if you can share your experiences of handling primary and secondary sources with particular attention to historical and ethnic circumstances. May I ask you, did you really ever feel sometimes really uncomfortable or um, not so sure whether the topics we are discussing today were really hugely significant and important? Wow. Well, thank you for yet another important question. And I can only begin to answer by saying that when dealing with the histories of interactions of great varieties of peoples, but having the circumstance of the records of those interactions being available in the language of only one of those peoples, in this case, classical or literary Chinese, necessity for striving to be a judicious mediator, as well as an interpreter with even-handedness is profound. 
even if it is not entirely always achievable. I think I was first struck by the gravity of this situation, this responsibility, really, when writing The Blacks of Pre-Modern China, trying to figure out a way to have sensitivity to those who could not speak for themselves, given that the records were inevitably in the voices of those who, in many occasions, were the oppressors. It's a difficult circumstance to be in, but I think once I found myself in it, the only way out was to keep going. And in the process, I gave considerable thought to the project as being one of managing to give voices to the voiceless and figuring out a way to bring people who had been marginalized in history more to the forefront, uh, more toward the center. And consequently, if anything, I came to feel that the project actually grew in importance for me over time. And I really didn't expect to be as ensnared and engaged in it as I eventually became. I'm not really sure if I've answered your question with complete adequateness, but I very much appreciate your your asking it because it is something that I've wrestled with and in fact still continue to wrestle with now. But with the passage of time, it's become an increasingly familiar combatant. And consequently, I think I've been able to surmount the challenge, at least on a few occasions, but certainly not all of them. Thank you so much for sharing these experiences. Now, regarding the origins of slavery in pre-modern and medieval China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, I have been pondering your thought-provoking argument that, I quote you here, war assuredly remained the prime impetus behind slavery throughout pre-modern history up to and throughout most, if not all, of the medieval age, end quote. When researching for my own book on Luoyang's Lomang Grottoes and Cultural Heritage, I came across a historical records from the 6th century CE that large numbers of those defeated Shang Dynasty's descendants were forced to relocate to a particular district in Luoyang, an ancient capital of China, around the 11th century BCE during the Western Zhou Dynasty, subsequently the Eastern Zhou, Yet, one and a half millennium afterwards, their descendants are still living in the state of servitude in the very same neighborhood of Luoyang, were still considered by the elites, the person who wrote that uh, six centuries book I read. So at the time, the earlier descendants of the Shang people, they were still considered uh, the Shang remnants. I'm quoting the six century, that author. So these people occupying the lowest status of social, political, and economic hierarchy under the so-called non-Chinese Tuoba rule in the very cradle of the so-called Chinese civilization, we know that well before the Common Era, East Asia was already a diverse place populated by people of widely different groups, races, and peoples. So why was there continued forced migration and trafficking of both East Asians as well as of Africans and native Southeast Asians? Historically, you know, you also reviewed the name, you know, Kunlun or Heifan, uh, Heigui and Heinu, etc. across pre-modern and medieval China, perhaps Korea, Japan and Vietnam. Because I'm asking this question is that I'm also thinking of the People's Republic of China, the PRC, 
because we know that uh, on paper, the Chinese Communist Party promoted and still promotes the kind of uh, what they would call the whole process, democracy. But uh, in reality, we know that ever since the beginning of the PRC, there were um, all different classes of people. You know, when actually the people were supposed to be liberated in the so-called New China, um, ever since 1949. Mm-hmm. And uh, yet, in the meantime, the Chinese people themselves have been divided either by class, by their familial background, or by situation. For example, if one was unfortunate uh, or is unfortunate to be born in the countryside, then means their social status, their registration, um, important registration status, Status would be forever labeled as as the class very inferior, even though gradually they there have been some kind of channels opened, but it has to be fought by them. And then, of course, these days in the city, the very issue of the kind of the citizenship or um, the rights, uh, who would get that, uh, are still a huge ongoing issue means that people are not equal at all. Um, This is the institutionalized (laughs) inequality. So now, (laughs) Dan, how would you? (laughs) The the stigma of the hukou. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, how would you, you know, what is your thoughts on the sustained (laughs) and uh, kind of a situation, internal and also external inequality. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, uh, a kind of complex question, but let me see if we can cut through to some answers. Addressing questions predominantly from the Chinese cultural arena, which was the primary, primary venue in which such exogenous enslavement Uh, that is, the enslavement of foreign peoples, variously defined, took place. The longevity of the practice was surely facilitated by changes in the law, specifically under the famous Tang Code, uh, the Tang Lu, instituted over the course of the 620s to the 650s. With respect to slavery, a conspicuous imposition of the code is that it became illegal to enslave any free Chinese commoner on pain of execution by strangulation. Needless to say, this provision led to a sharp shrinking in the endogenous pool of persons potentially subjectable to enslavement. However, this same provision had the collateral effect of intensifying and expanding the market for exogenous slaves. With these peoples that you have mentioned, Africans and native Southeast Asians, uh, historically Kunlun, Heifan, Heigwei, Huinu, becoming targeted as prime prospective uh, enslavement possibilities. And this had a way of perpetuating the tradition um, uh, well beyond the period in which this transformation took place. Consequently, this was a real change also, I think, because the Tang Code was similarly influential in Korea, uh, in Japan, and to a somewhat lesser degree, but also in, in Vietnam. But I think that helps to account for the fact that Long after the subjugation of native Chinese to enslavement had begun to subside, there was continued profiteering in the enslavement under other non-Chinese individuals. They were targeted as prime prospects, I think, for centuries. Yeah, thank you, Dan. You made a powerful statement in your 2022 book. I quote you here. War as the wellspring and 
mainspring of、uh, slavery, bondage, and、uh, human trafficking is unique neither to East Asia nor to the medieval period of history. Yet the fact that a mode of institutionalized subjugating might even have been globally shared and subscribed to hardly diminishes its overarching and overbearing significance as the presumptive operational enslavement framework that was so perniciously imposed on untold numbers of individuals across the medieval East Asian world, which had no defense against it, to regard it as anything less and、uh, estimates the enormities of its debilitating scope and depth. Devaluing a singularity results only in disservice to the legacies of the countless medieval East Asian minions whose lives, liberties, and aspirations, oftentimes from birth, were so summarily oppressed and unforgivingly crushed by it. End quote. So, what was peculiar and universal about、uh, slavery in East Asia, Don? Probably the fact that because it was never strictly racially based, as became the case in Europe and certainly later in the Americas and the United States, slavery's durability in East Asia. Is accompanied by a kind of invisibility. The institution itself was not as easily detectable or discernible as in the West, largely because it was not constrained by racial priority. Universal, certainly for the medieval period, and that, by my usage, is the sixth through the sixteenth century of the Common Era. Or was the undisputed generator of slavery? This phenomenon, this dynamic, with war serving as a sort of facilitator, even the handmaiden of slavery, is a process that really linked very closely with slavery as it was practiced in the medieval West. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah,、uh, thank you. It's very helpful. Well, I'm going to actually to continue actually along the line because,、uh, as I understand,、uh, really like racism or slavery were not institutionally or intellectually reflected yet.、Uh, particularly, I would think.、Uh, In the context of of China, it's only just lately we know that、uh, what happened to, for example, the the Manchus at the turn of the twentieth、uh, century. In my own new book on Xi Chen Tai, as a part of a joint effort to uncover those lost voices, as you are.、Uh, Doing, actually, in history, I wrote that I'm quoting myself here. Notions of racial purity, oneness, unity, as devotion to God, prevalent in the Australian Federation, were toward the end of Qing China, from 1644 to 1911, 1912. Matched by many Chinese radicals at the time, in the form of racial pronouncements that singled the Manchus out as the other race who usurped a pure Chinese dynasty, the Ming, from 1368 to 1644. Racism of this sort held that held the Manchus solely culpable for China's modern backwardness, and therefore it aimed to annihilate them in an effort. 
culture to restore pristine China. This version of racial purity is as clearly expressed in Sun Yixian's revolutionary slogan, quoting here, expel the Tatars means the Manchus and restore China. And quote as it was in Xie's 1924 account of the 1911 revolution, and of course, Xi、uh, Jinping's、um, racist perceptions extended to to the black people as well. I'm not go- going to quote what Xi wrote at the time, but then is to continue our conversation on this. It's.、Uh, Do you know how and what have the historical facts of the internal and external slavery and racism being reflected in, for example, Chinese historiography? Has it been? Well, Chinese historiography on the subject of slavery, generally, whether considering it internal or external, has been and largely continues to be. Influenced by influence, I use a polite word, has been influenced by the overlay of Marxism, and by this I mean the controversial thesis advanced of、uh, a slave society, Guomo Ro, and his writings. Interesting to note that he based himself on research that he had originally revealed twenties, but continued to adjust and revise through the nineteen forties and early nineteen fifties. In Korean and Japanese or in Vietnamese historiographies, where in slavery, when it is broached, has been rightly treated as a mostly native phenomenon, internal phenomenon. The folk has been on slavery as a system of native exploitation, with questions of racism, therefore, somewhat understandably, rarely being addressed. However, while I, an optimist,、uh, I'm really not. I think there's actually good reason to anticipate new research in this direction beginning to emerge. Yeah, I've met a few. I've met a few promising grad students who、uh, who are going to、uh, take the gauntlet and move it, take the ball and move it further toward the goalpost. Yeah, indeed, and thank you very much for sharing your viewpoints. Um, as far as I know, because、uh, I have been doing quite a lot of reading of the nineteenth and and of course twenties and twenty first centuries history books, and very often I feel the historical topics such as slavery and racism, like for example in the PRC. Are like somebody else problems. It's like only the the United States problem. So that is the predominating、uh, kind of theme. If ever there is any work written rationally in history of slavery, that would be the United States problem. So that、uh, there there is、uh, not much one would ever think.、Uh, is there any ref- Reflection、um, on the part of the、uh, Chinese language historiography to really to unravel those hidden histories actually on the same topics. So、um, I appreciate your、uh, sharing your、um, research findings. Now, Dan, would you be able to to speak about、uh, the lingering and new forms of spoken and unspoken prejudices against the blacks in East Asia, and against each other among quite some Asians、uh, in Asia and in other places of the world? It's an uncomfortable topic. We must say that. But、um, we have uh, uh, seen some reports, for example, about、uh, the black community in the Guangzhou, the Canton area. This is we're talking about even during the COVID,、uh, their experiences and、uh, um, other similar reports. Then. 
also in the meantime we also know that um there have been afro Asian solidarity movements, um, we could say dating back to probably um, the um, early and mid 20th century from and onwards to our own time as well. So would you be able to share um, your take on what the agencies and drivers for such a reality uh, were and are? Well, since it involves the contemporary situation, this might be the most challenging of your questions of all, but let me give it a stab. On the one hand, East Asian prejudice against Blacks has age-old roots and yet contemporary triggers. Just as um, discord between various Asian groups, for instance, Chinese versus Japanese and so forth and so on. On the other hand, I think there are some very salient contemporary developments that have influenced this type of friction. And the one thing I think I can point to that probably will not raise too much dispute on the part of uh, others is simply the fact that there's been a, a rather striking and overt rise of authoritarianism in the political sphere across uh, both uh, Western and Asian nations. And I think whenever uh, you see authoritarianism rise, you see the rights minorities suffer. And uh, you see minorities become subject to victimization. And without being overly specific about that, I think most people uh, know the sorts of political actors the, and the, the actions that they are driving uh, I think most people know the personalities that I have in mind with regard to this. Again, I'm not much of an optimist, but as you yourself stated, there have been uh, longstanding movements, Afro-Asian solidarity, and particularly, I think, in the academic spheres, these... Um, sorts of alliances hold much promise for the future. And they are empowered largely as uh, educational vehicles. Part of their mission is to combat prejudice. And um, as long as probably inhabit the earth, there are prob there's probably going to be prejudice and inequality. But hopefully... As long as we inhabit the earth, there's also going to be movement towards solidarity and people willing to stand up to put sometimes their lives on the line to bend us toward the arc of justice. Thank you. That is a positive note, Dang. As you may know, I'm also optimist. So I also believe in human progress. So let's hope societies can become better for the majority and of course the minority peoples. So now may I ask you, we have uh, taken up a lot of your time. May I ask you, what are you working on professionally these days? The first matter of business is that I am at work uh, and completing uh, a second Cambridge element, this time more, I guess, in terms of subject matter, more mainstream, 
that being a text on film China and the world. So again, I uh, continue to inhabit this important, crucial period between uh, the 10th and the 13th centuries of the Common Era. I'm also working as a set editor on an important new series called The Medieval World by Bloomsbury Publishing. It's going to result in four volumes globally balanced, involving the, the important theme of ethnicity and race. And it's a long-term project, I guess, because it involves many people, many personalities, but it's moving ahead. And I continue to work, uh, among other things, on a project, uh, sort of long-term, sort of uh, summary statement on foreign slaves in China. And this, in addition to a rash of other things that I won't take up your time dwelling on, but I have managed to continue to stay active. And having a few more things that I still have left to say, I'll, I'll try to continue in that vein. Thank you. These projects sound exciting, and I'm looking forward to reading more of your work, Don. Well, thank you, Don. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Particularly, this is uh, on actually a weekend, so I appreciate you sharing the the great insights with the audience around the world. Well, I appreciate you making time for me. It's uh, it's a weekend for you too. It's been a real pleasure to reflect on these few things that I have accomplished. And I'm delighted that my production is generating at least some interest. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, so long for now. All right. And so on for now, and uh, here's to our, our future uh, continued communication.